Who would, I mean, who would have known? Welcome to class number three, Ancient Civilization, Mystery, Religion. Just reading this uh, author, Bill Cooper. He's just fabulous. He's from England. When did we first find out about this guy's work, Savieta? Probably back in the late 90s, 96, 97. I mean, this is just a, this book after the flood, Mr. Cooper, he's got, he's got library privileges all over England, Oxford, Cambridge. And uh, all he does is study ancient history. He's talking about Beowulf. He has a chapter here, Beowulf. And, and the question we have is, can a, could a brave warrior, now he's got to be a, he's got to be a little bit of an athlete, you know, he's, He's not going to be a wimp. He's got to be tall and strong, and but he's in hand-to-hand -hand combat with a with a T-Rex. Could a could a brave man with a sword, a brave warrior with a sword, take on a Tyrannosaurus Rex? And we laugh at that idea, but we have a lot of evidence for the contemporary con, the contemporaneity. They were contemporary contemporaries contemporaneous. How do I make that into a noun? <laughs> of man and dinosaurs. And here is a Babylonian, is this a, from a steel, from a cylinder seal. A cylinder seal, they would carve it and I, they got to do it in reverse engraving. Like a signet ring, yeah. it's, you got it, it's like a negative. I mean, you'd have to really be a good, yeah. You almost have to cross your eyes to engrave it. But then they take it and they roll it in, in ink and then they put it on a paper. And that's how you would make, you know, that was the printing. They would have those cylinders and then they would send it out abroad. Whatever they wrote down. You know, maybe some royal decree. But, but here is a picture of a warrior fighting what appears to be, it looks like a griffin, but in all probability could have been a dinosaur. It's a dragon. And Cooper asked the question, is this, was Beowulf's method of mortally wounding Grendel entirely novel, or was he merely employing a tried and tested strategy? This illustration is from an early Babylonian cylinder seal. It portrays a man seizing and about to amputate the forelimb of a Grendel-like bipedal monster. And we know that the T-Rex that the or the Allosaurus, is, uh, his weakest members would be the, the arm, the hands. So it's very plausible that that story could be true. It could be actually history when we read that. When we read this, every you know, senior year in high school, we read the, the first work of English literature, this, this Anglo-Saxon epic poem. And why is this significant? Well, Bill Cooper has studied this poem thoroughly. I did a paper in college on this, and the sword, I think it was called uh, Rothgar, the, the name of the sword, Hygelic, Hygelic. And on that sword was inscribed the story of a race of demonic men that that became giants, and they uh, they were on the earth, and there was the, they angered the God in heaven, and He sent a flood, and there that flood swept these race of giants away. Now, where did they get the race of giants? They got that from Genesis six. This is a this is written by pagans. How did the pagans know that there was a race of giants that arose? That they may not have known all about the intermarriage of the of the fallen angels, the Bene Elohim, and the daughters of men, but they knew that, that that's one of the purposes of the flood, was to destroy uh, those, that, those rebels. After the flood, we never again have things like that going on. And it was an extraordinary situation. I told you, you know, I might have a few theories, but we just don't really know how that they were able to engineer that, but it happened. So the question is, how do these pagans have information? Well, the standard, it, what they're taught, what the, what, the, what the English teachers are told to say in the teacher's manual, you know, that we, have the, we have the textbook, they have the textbook and the teacher's manual, you know, really point out that these are, 
insertions, that there were these pious monks that forged the story and put all that stuff in there. But there's a lot of problems with that, Bill Cooper says. One of the things, one of the problems with that interpretation is that we have Beowulf's genealogy. And uh, we, we know his genealogy. We have the genealogies of the Bible, and it's very interesting. He quotes somebody that is totally dismissed today, but there were genealogies. The pagans had genealogies. If you study the name, we have them, in, and he lists them in his appendix. We have uh, their king lists. They have a divine right of kings, and these are what we call sacrosanct. Can you imagine if you broke in to the department, you know, broke into the well, to the king's library, and you're in his, you know, you break into the room where all his archives and documents are kept, and you try to forge a name, go back and, you know, maybe take out the House of Kent or Windsor or, you know, the, the Duke or the Earl of this, uh, you know, the, the Lancasters, the House of Lancaster, the House of York, the Rose, the War of the Roses, and you try to insert your own family, what would happen to you? If you lived back in those days, it would be, you would be put to death. I mean, those are, because it's the divine right of kings. Now, where do they get this idea that God had pre pretty much appointed a family to, to, be the, to carry out a monarch, a dynasty of men? Where do they get that at? Even the, fa even the idea of a divine right of kings. That takes you all the way back to the beginning. Who's the first divine right? So... I mean, it's so exciting because, look, here's, uh, we have, we have the, uh, the genealogies of each of these nations. Uh, for instance, uh, let's see here. You got the descent of the Swedish and Danish royal houses. Helfdane begot Hrothgar, Hrothgar begot Hrothmund, Hrethric, all of these, these are the, these are the, the genealogies of Beowulf. Hygelic, there's Hygelic. The Geats, the Swertings, the descent of the Geatish royal house, Hrethel, 445 A.D., he begot Waymunding, Waymunding begot Haraldbald, 470 to 502, and so on. And they have uh, Wexton, and uh, he had a son. He was the paternal uncle to Beowulf. And then you have uh, the Beowulf, 495 to 583 AD, Wiglaf, Beowulf's cousin, so on and so forth. So the question is if, is if a bunch of pious monks between you know the sixth century A.D. and let's say uh, Saint Patrick in the 800s are tampering with you know these uh, stories and these documents and the genealogies. That's a contradiction because they're I mean they're it's under penalty of death and we have the genealogies here and Beowulf was a part of that. All right, here's the descent of the East Saxon kings. Here's the Saxons. We are, we're Anglo-Saxons, right? And it goes back to Noah. They actually kept the king list for all the way back to Noah when he got off board the ark. He had a son, and his name was Seaf. S-C-E-A-F. Now, I wonder who that could be. Yeah. 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 Well, it, it's Shem, but Shem and Seth in the Hebrew are, are both have the same meaning, to be appointed in the place of. So Shem and Seth are like synonyms. And then Woden. Woden goes down, and then you have... Uh, you end up, you end up, Siexnet, Gisegek, Ansek, Swapa, Sigfug, Bedka, Ofa, Aswine, Sled, and you just keep coming down. Siak, Sigforth, Sellerforth, Sigbald, and then you come down to the House of Essex, which brings you into the, to uh, ancient England. We have also, uh, these are from, these king lists, now, they're recorded by Geoffrey of Monmouth. He's a, he's a famous author, and they're like, well, that's got to be just a bunch of mythology. That's just got to be make-believe. Because there's no way a secular scholar can, uh, can imagine that pagan kings were keeping king lists all the way back to Noah. The genealogy of the early British kings, Noah, Japheth, Javan, 
Yebeth, Bath, Israel, Ezra, Re, Aber, Oth, Ekthet, Arkthak, Ethek, Mer, Simeon, Boib, Thos, Ugamam, Thetaber, Alanus. And then it goes down into the Welsh Chronicles. And it takes you, you're basically going from uh, 1000 BC, Gwendolyn, Madden, Membrigus, Abracus, Brutus, 19 other sons, 30 daughters, 945 BC, Lair, uh, Hudibras, Bladud, Lair, Regan, Cunidegus, Rivalo, Gergistius, Camarcus, Ferrex, 200 year period of civil war, Pinner, Cloton, Dunvalo, Bellinius. Now you're getting down to the time of the, pro the Jewish prophets. And here, these are all genealogies. And every one of them goes back to this guy named Seif and his father Noah. So all of these just uh, Welsh chronicles. It's, it's a remarkable book. But what is he, what's the point of all this? The point of all this is that there, his first chapter, there was a knowledge of God among the early pagans. There was a knowledge of God. What's happening is that they're going in time. Let's go to Acts 17. I, I was going to take you to Genesis 10. Uh, you got your finger in Genesis 10? So you're not allowed to tamper with those king lists. And that's a contradiction to the idea of a bunch of pious monks, you know, inserting trying to convert heathen, pagan, you know, Anglo-Saxons by inserting th these uh, references. Furthermore, th they're not Christian references. There's no references to, to Jesus or to Christ or Jesus of Nazareth. Paul, Paul puts in Jesus of Nazareth, okay, because mm -hmm. we're talking about the Gospel Age Acts, but, the, but these references can't be pious monks because they're putting Genesis, references to a creator God and Genesis reference. Really, Christ isn't getting a whole lot of glory out of that, relatively speaking. Did somebody get that chair out? We need to put that back. If you're going to try to convert people to Christ, you're not going to put uh, obscure references to Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 8, and Genesis chapter 10. You know, you're going to go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, right? So, what we're trying to say is Beowulf may not be this exaggerated, you know, fictional account of some superhero killing dragons. There, there is a kernel of truth. Uh, among all these myths. And that's why we're studying them, because we're sitting there asking ourselves the question, you know, what, what are these guys preserving? What are they trying to say? And uh, the information that they present, actually, we can show, substantiates that they did have a knowledge of God. So Genesis 10, we've got the sons of Javan. We've got, you know, we've got the sons, we've got grandsons of Noah. We've got descendants. Remember how many peoples we had? We counted 70, right? And you can, you can interpret all of the, not interpret, you can, it, the Genesis 10 is a template. William Albright said this is an amazing, astonishingly, astonishingly accurate document. It can be applied to any study of where people comes from, anthropology, ethnology, where people comes from, and peoples come from, and you can trace it out. It'll never be wrong. It'll never steer you wrong. Those ancient names. Josephus is important because that is written about a century after Christ. It's about 100 A.D. Josephus is writing, covering the Jewish War of 70 A.D. But in his first book, the, the Antiquities of the Jews, he tells you where all these peoples are in his day. Now, let's go to, what, where did I want to take you? What's that? Acts 17. Yeah, Acts 17. Because, because the Greeks, remember the guy's name that said that the, all the gods basically are men that once lived? Do you remember his name? He lived about 400 years before Christ. Remember that guy's name? Started with an E-U. Euhemerus. Euhemerus. 
Yes, Hugh Hemerus is the guy that started a school of philosophy, and he said basically all these religion, all this you know religion that we know as myths were basically real men, and they were deified. They were turned into deity. It's like your fish story. Every time you tell it, it gets bigger and bigger. You know the fish you catch, so it gets bigger. And so, what did Paul say? He said that. Uh, in verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worship with men's hands as though he needs anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. He's determined the pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. And then he says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. So Paul's quoting some of these poets. We look them up. We know who their names are. Cleanthes, Erastus. Uh, these are men that were writing poems to Zeus, but they had the memory. They knew that, see, Zeus was known as the father. And not everybody, not everybody who worshipped idols and gods had the idea that God was the father. But these guys said, you know, this is the father of the gods. And Paul said, you know, you're on the right track there. Because God is the father. We are his offspring. You get it? We are the, God the Father is the creator. And this is, a, this is very important because the Greeks really were creationists. Something that I, so shocked me. Uh, Socrates, Plato, some of these guys that wrote the Republic, they all believed in a higher being. He was a spirit. In fact, they had this theory called the theory of forms, Plato's form. He says, take these forms, beauty, perfection, you know, could be geometry, and take it, take it, postulate it from the physical to the spiritual. And he says, you go back to the beginning and you'll find God, which is the first cause. It's really the law of what Plato is doing with his theory of forms is really what we call today uh, the first cause. The first cause. Because the, the, the cause has to be greater than the effect. We see the effects, see? We see the effects. We see love. We see life. We, say, we see order, perfection, beauty, all these things. And you take that back. You know, how did it come about? Well, it came from this. Well, where did that come from? Well, it came from this. Well, you just keep asking, where did that come from? Where did that come from? And you, kind of have, you have to come back to the first cause. You know, who's the, who's the giver of life? We see living things all around us. Well, how did it get to be alive? Well, you know, it evolved from this. Well, where did that evolve from? What evolved from this? What evolved from that? Evolved. Finally, you just have to say, you know, it evolved from inanimate matter. And that's a hard one to believe. So, but you just say, you know, this, but the, but the Gospels are more rational because, you know, Jesus was a son of Joseph, Mary, you know, on Heli, all the way back, Solomon, David, and you just go backwards, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you go back, and at Luke chapter 3, he's the son of God. It's a lot easier to believe. You know, Adam is the son of God, because he, by creation. So the Greeks were creationists. It blew my mind. Now there were evolutionists. There were Greeks who were evolutionists, and they, they, would, arrive, they would try to say that life arose from and they had these certain fundamental sources like water, earth, air, and they called, uh, you know, they called, uh, the earth was called Gaia. They, they worshipped it, the Gaia, Gaia hypothesis. And so the atmos the sky, the atmosphere would be the father and the earth would be the mother. That's where they get the idea of Mother Earth. <laughs> and now you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a Greek, it's a cosmogony, which is the creation story of the Greeks. But, but they, so they had, basically they were having a creation evolution debate. And in Greek days, in Acts 17, these are what the Stoics and Epicureans are fighting about. Paul is debating with them. I skipped over that. You can go back to Acts 17, 18. That's what these philosophers, you know, they're sitting there really, they're debating the universe, they're debating how did we get here, the origin and the, and the religion, you know, the gods. They know something's wrong. They know something's wrong because it's, it's pretty childish, you know, really to think of their gods and the origin of their religion, which today are myths. But we're going we're gonna to study a few of them. 
But he says, he says in verse 29, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, you know, God is our Father. We read in James 1, 19 that, he's, that God is the Father of every good and perfect gift. Comes down from above, the, the, the Father of lights. We ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver, stone, something shaped by arts and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all men everywhere to repent. So, these times of ignorance. So, what happened was, men went away from God, and they lost the knowledge of Him. So, religion didn't evolve, it devolved. Are you with me? If you were to graph it, it would be a graph of, if you would be to graph of, say, organization through time, we would say that, that, uh, that atheism devolved. Most, you know, where did Adam get his information about God? Adam got his information about God from God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So then, they, then it's up to them to pass it on to their kids, on to them to pass it down to the kids. And, you know, if you're, if you're fortunate, God will come and talk to you himself and say, you know, I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac, but I want to be your God too. But these are patriarchal times. Say, that's how God worked in those days. In Romans 1, they lost their knowledge of God. And in, if you turn to Romans 1, now Romans 1 could apply to many different generations. I think Romans 1 applies to the Tower of Babel. I think the Tower of Babel, before the flood was bad, after the flood is bad. But it says in verse uh, 20, uh, well, 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. That's a powerful verse. God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power in God, so that they were without excuse. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, what about the people that never heard about Christ? You ever heard people say that? You know, how's God going to judge them? They never heard about Christ. What does Romans 1.20 say? Even if you could find somebody. It, you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody on this planet today that hasn't heard about Jesus Christ. I'd say somebody, everybody's heard about Him some way or another. Some yeah. form. Well, yeah, because that's why we have missionary organizations. We have Bible translators, Wycliffe Bible translators, Pioneer Bible translators. Friends of mine are, you know, raise money and go on a mission field. Even just to learn a dialect. I think they got all the languages covered. There may be a few dialects. So they're studying them, they're living among them, and then they're going to try to, you know, find the right words to communicate, and they're going to translate the, the New Testament into their language. But the beauty, I knew how you knew I wanted to chime in, but the beauty of English is that a lot of the dialects, they'll learn the main dialect, and then those disciples, the native disciples, will translate them further into the dialects that, you know, can are almost impossible, you know, for yeah. native English speakers. So that's what's happening, like in places like India, where they're starting to have Indian preachers who are then expanding into, right. you know, all the different dialects, which is awesome. Yeah. You'd be hard-pressed to find somebody. I'm thinking about, like, there was a lost tribe in, uh, like, New Guinea, Papua New Guinea. How about the missionaries that died back in the late 50s? Where were they at? Where were they at? Remember, you, Homer, you read a book, you and Drew read a book about them? The Elliot, Jim, uh, was it Jim Elliot? Mm -hmm. Well, they went down there to preach the God, the Akka. Remember, Drew? Yeah. Remember, you read about them? The Gates of Splendor. Somebody wrote a book called The, the Gates of Splendor, the Akan tribe. Was that Ecuador? What was that? Was it in Ecuador, Drew? It's the jungle down in South America. Remember? And they, they were. What was the book called? Well, the, Jim Elliot, yeah, they were. They died. They, they could have carried sidearms. They knew that their lives were in danger. They said, "But if we carry sidearms and we get attacked and we defend ourselves, we're going to defeat the very purpose we're there." I mean, that takes a lot of guts. Yeah. They said, "We'll defeat the very purpose why we're there." So they, so they put themselves into the mercy of God. But they were, they flew planes. They had all kind of. They were aviation pioneers. They had this long rope, they would put their plane in a tight circle, and they would let out a long rope, and they could actually bring a bucket up, flying at 170 miles an hour, <laughs> flying in a circle. That's pretty good. Yeah, and they would, they would put gifts down. They were trying to, and, and uh, it took their death, but then eventually the many of the tribe accepted the Lord. They you were able to teach. 
How did that happen? Their widows went down. Mm -hmm. And it was the widows who converted all the tribes. Yeah. So after their husbands, it was three husbands, all yeah. the widows and their yeah. families, they went to the tribes. And they had some kind of a primitive video camera, and when they found it at the site, and they looked at the pictures, or maybe just a camera, they took some pictures, and one of their, trend, one of their interpreters was really upset because she recognized one of the people in that and went and they talked to them and they're like, yeah, we didn't know. We didn't know. But they were warlike. They were culturally, they, they were culturally challenged. It was just a remote tribe and they were so warlike, they almost went extinct. If you're always living in a state of war, yeah. you're going to lose. I was amazed the Apaches, you know, the Apaches, the, our military loves, you know, the Apache helicopter, one of the most warlike Indians. And I, I, I was amazed they only had like 40 people left in their tribe. They were, the, yeah, down in, it was it New Mexico, Arizona, when uh, Geronimo, one of the great warriors, yeah. but they just were always at war. And so, but I'm just saying in Romans 1 that they're without excuse. We'd be hard pressed to find somebody, but even if we did, they're not going to get off because of their ignorance. Because in Acts 17, Paul said, the days of the ignorance God tolerated. He overlooked it. In the Old Testament, God would put up with a lot of ignorance. But now he commands every, all men everywhere to repent. And that's what, uh, that's what uh, the same point in Romans 1.20. Well, wouldn't it be, you couldn't claim it, ignorance because, <clears throat> and I don't know where it is, but in the Bible says that the law is written upon your heart. Yeah, yes. That would be Romans 5. Yes, so they couldn't come yeah, or Romans 3, right. Because everybody has a conscience. So where did we get our conscience from? We got our conscience from God. Yeah. Didn't evolve. You know, our, con our, our conscience and our guilt, when we do wrong, that didn't evolve. Because animals don't have a conscience. They have instincts. And somebody said, you know, it's not the animal's fault that we fell. They're, they're glorifying God with their instincts. So you can't say we're worse than animals because animals actually are are good. They're good by creation. Uh, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. Their foolish hearts were darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds, four-footed animals, creeping things, and so on and so forth. So again, religion, uh, paganism didn't evolve, it devolved. That's what I'm trying to say. So what are we going to do now? Because we're going to find we're going to find all kind of evidences of for God in these myths. We're going to we're turning the tables. We're going to show that these people that forgot God still retained him. It didn't happen overnight. It took a long time. And even there that's why Paul said in Acts 17, even your own poets, your the people that came before. I think Cleanthes was 600 years before Christ. Okay, and the 400 years is the golden age of Greece. So they didn't just lose this identity overnight. All right, I'm halfway done. We're tracking. Any questions so far or comments? Uh, we're trying to lay some bases down. Are you with me? You with me, Rebecca? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Yep. Yeah. All right, who's the, who's the Greek philosopher who said that these gods were just real men who lived in the past? Euhemerus. Euhemerus, okay. And uh, Genesis 10, what, is, what do we call that? Alex? Well, they are patriarchs. What do we call Genesis 10? It's the table of? Table of nations. Table of nations. All the nations come from there. You take all those names, okay? And then let's see. What else do we have here? All right. Let's go where we picked up last time in Ezekiel 8. Ezekiel 8 because... Now, is Ezekiel early in Hebrew history or, or late? Is it early or late? Is it 2,500 years B.C. or is it uh, about 700 B.C.? 600. I would say 600 B.C., the date of Ezekiel. Well, there you go. 600 B.C. is rather late, right? Mm -hmm. When was Malachi written? What's the last book of the Old Testament chronologically? The last book of the Old Testament, uh, chronologically. 
What's the last book of the Old Testament? Malachi. Malachi, yes, Malachi. Not doing that that testament trick. <laughs> Not doing the testament <laughs> trick on you. What's the last book, Natalie, chronologically? That was my 15 minute warning. Mm. Chronologically? Yeah. Daniel. Yeah, close. Esther. Esther. Mm -hmm. The Persian. And Daniel would be late because Daniel lived from Jerusalem to Babylon, 70 years of Babylon to Persia. So the Persian Empire. That's where Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther would be the last books. But see, since they're history, they throw them up in the, you got the law, you got the history, then you got the prophets. And you got the poetic books in there, I forgot about them. So then they just put the prophets. So Malachi is the last. You got the big prophets and then the little prophets. That's just the order. I think the Septuagint put them in that order, if I'm not mistaken. We'll look. I think when they translated the Greek, uh, the Hebrew into the Greek, down in Alexandria, Egypt. You know, Alexandria, Egypt was a big... That was a big deal. That was a hotbed of uh, Judaism. It was an intellectual town. They had a big library there. It ended up getting burned down. What year was that? You would ask me. <laughs> uh, in the Roman time period. Probably, probably with uh, Julius Caesar and Cleopatra and Mark Antony. I'll bet that's when it happened. We'll look it up. Yeah. That's my gut feeling. All right, Ezekiel 8. Uh, 13, 13 through 15. Who's got Ezekiel 8, 13 through 15? Again, he told me, you will see them committing even greater abominations. And then my phone's ringing. <laughs> I'll call her back. Yeah. Okay. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord, and I saw women sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I got a date of Ezekiel. It's about, it's about between 592 and 570 B.C. Are you guys okay? No, I'm going to text her just see. Go ahead. We can, we can take a break. Right. Why don't you text her? Back Why don't you... Go ahead, go ahead, buddy. So we got 592 to 570 BC, the date of Exodus. Uh, I'm sorry, the date of Ezekiel. Uh, so they're they're sitting at the gate, weeping, weeping for Tammuz. So who's this Tammuz? I got in my footnote a, Sur a Sumerian Sumerian fertility god, similar to the Greek god Adonis. You got Adonis? I had, I had looked up Or do you have Dumazi? I had looked up that You did? Before, um, What'd you find out? I left it in my notes somewhere. All right, look up Dumazi. Remember Dumazi because that ties, this ties the Bible in with the Gilgamesh epic. Okay. A mortal lover of the goddess Aphrodite. Aphrodite is the goddess of love in Greek mythology. Ovid tells the... Ovid was the writer in the first century. Ovid's book was Metamorphosis. I think it's with a book that uh, he wrote. First century AD, he tells the myth. Hmm, just trying to talk about Adonis here. All right, it's, let's see here. Well, is, it a, is he a son of Aphrodite? Now, how did you spell that? Because that's... Dumazi? Yeah. D-U-M-U-Z-I. But I'm saying Dumazi is the, is the spelling used in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Tammuz is the equivalent, which is in the Bible. So they're weeping for Tammuz, and Tammuz is identified by the Greek uh, myth of Adonis. All right. The, the Transformed her into a myrrh tree. In the form of a tree, she gave birth to Adonis. Aphrodite found the infant and gave him to be raised by Persephone, the queen of the underworld. Adonis grew into an astonishingly handsome young man, causing Aphrodite and Persephone to feud over him, with Zeus eventually decreeing... 
How are we doing, buddy? Good. Zeus eventually decreeing Adonis would spend one third of the year in the underworld with Persephone, one third of the year with Aphrodite, and the final third of the year with whomever he chose. Adonis chose to spend his final third of the year with Aphrodite. So he spends two thirds with Aphrodite and one third with Persephone down in the underworld. You know, you know how Persephone got to the underworld? Um, yeah, kind of do. How did he get? How did she get down there? Hades kidnapped her. Yeah. Yeah. Hades kidnapped her. One day, now listen to this. One day, Adonis was gored by a wild boar during a hunting trip and died in Aphrodite's arms as she wept. His blood mingled with her tears, became the anemone flower. Aphrodite declared the Adonia, the Adonia festival commemorating his tragic death, which was celebrated by women every year in midsummer. During this festival, Greek women would plant gardens of Adonis, small pots containing fast-growing plants, which they would set on top of their houses in the hot sun. The plants would sprout, soon wither and die. The women would mourn the death of Adonis, tearing their clothes, beating their breasts in public display of grief. The Greeks considered Adonis' cult to be of Near Eastern origin. Adonis' name comes from a Canaanite word meaning Lord. Well, yeah. Adonai? Yeah. Adonai? And most modern scholars consider the story of Aphrodite and Adonis to be derived from the earlier Mesopotamian myth of Inanna, Ishtar, and Dumazi, in parentheses, Tammuz. Mm -hmm. So, what do we know about him? You know, he had a beautiful mom, who's the goddess of love, and he's a handsome guy, but how did he die? And they go out hunting, they love to go out hunting. <laughs> what, do you like to what do you like to butcher? Pig or a boar, a, a wild boar. Now, what's, signif what's significant? What's the difference between a boar and a bull? One's bovine, the other's uh, swine. One, they both have horns. A pig don't. Or tusks. tusks. A tusk. I'm going to call a tusk a horn. One has the power in his head, the symbol of royalty. The other has the power in the mouth which is the symbol of judicial prosecution. The boar is going to be the symbol of the instrument by which the child who grows up is put to death, the boar. We're going to find that over and over, the boar. But with, the, with these, with these uh, myths, a lot of times their good guy will be to the Christians the bad guy, and their bad God will be to the Christian the good God. So you gotta, it's like a negative. You've got to turn it around in reverse, especially when we get to Osiris in Egypt. Let's do, let's do a couple more, and then we'll quit. Uh, all right, so we got... We got uh, So Tammuz and Dumazi. Let's let, let's have the uh, the mother. It's called the Trinity. It's the pagan Trinity. It's not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it's it's a father, mother, and child. All right. So if we go to Sumer, we've got we don't know who the father is. Let's let's take let's let's make some notes here. Let's uh, have some lists. Let's go to Sumer, and we have the female is we're going to put inanna i n a n n a and then a slash ishtar i s h t a r and then the child would be tammuz or damazi now we go to we go to uh canaanite uh, well let's go to the greece because that's who they identify the story with we've got We've got uh, Aphrodite, and then we've got the child Adonis. Be marrying Christ and our. That's exactly right. That's exactly where we're going. Yeah. Yep. Now the the uh, the Indians have a trinity as well. Mother and child. I'm trying to remember. Uh, They're more Deva Parvati and Devaki. They have a mother and child. We'll we'll look at that. I need more time to. I've got it in a book. We've got to go back and study the mother and child. 
Indians. Oh, no, no, no. The child is Krishna. My bad. It's Krishna. Krishna is the child. Even the Indians that were over here. Devaki is the mother. They, uh, they even knew of Christ. Yes. Now, let's, uh, let's go to, let's do, let's do Egypt. Let's do Egypt. Uh, we're going to do Egypt. Hmm. Now, it's funny that ish, ish is a syllable. Do you remember the story of the Gilgamesh epic? No, that's not an I-S-H, that's E-S-H. Remember the guy that told him the story of the flood? Remember what his name was? Ut, Nu, Pish, Tim, Nu, Ish, the man, Noah, Ish is Hebrew for the man. Okay, and then we find Nu, which is Noah. We find him all through the gods. and uh, the gods. Usually he's a good, good god. The Indians called him the preserver. How is Noah the preserver? Did he throw out a life preserver? Yeah, basically, kind of, not really, but... He built, a, he built an ark, didn't he? That was like throwing out a life preserver, yeah. wasn't it? For the human race, right? Real big one. <laughs> Ishtar is a woman's name, and yet it means, Ish means the man, and Tor is who built towers. Now, how could, who is the man who built a tower? And that becomes the name of the female goddess. So first of all, who is the man who built the first tower? And how did that become to be the name of a woman? And we're going to get Ashtoreth all through the Old Testament. We'll go to Canaanite. We'll go to Canaan next time. Because we got all kind of Bible verses on Baal and Ashtoreth. We'll, we'll set Egypt up and then we'll quit and come back. Let's go to Exodus. Uh, I think it's in chapter 14. No, 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 I'm sorry, Tw chapter 12. In Exodus 12, verse 12. He says, I want you to get ready to take the Lord's Passover. Verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Is there a death angel in there? You see a death angel? You know, we're, we, we were told in, the, in Sunday school about a death angel. Was there a death angel? No, God himself. Exactly, exactly. Now that could be God the Son. We don't yeah. know, you know, who could be that God the Father stayed up in heaven. It could be uh, God the Son, but He said, "I'm going to execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. I am is a good indicator." All right. They, they, they're, now that we have, we have two. There's important in distinction. All these cultures have a creation. They have a creation set of gods who created, and then they got a second group of gods who basically were, uh, they have a creation myth, and then they have their myth of uh, the order of things and the people. It, they have two tiers, like the Greeks had t the Titans, and then they had the Olympians. They had the second order overthrowing the first order. All of, all of them seem to do this. In Babylon, Babylon, the Babylonian myths, you have creation stories, and then you have the gods and goddesses who regulated people's lives. You know, you got Baal, you know, Zeus throwing thunderbolts. Baal was the god of the sun. He's, he throws thunder, thunderbolts. He has female concert as Ashtoreth. Same with the god in Egypt, Osiris. They're not creation gods. Those are the first tier. So you've got to remember, there's two tiers. Each culture that we're going to have has creation gods, and then they have the people gods. And I, why is that? I think, I think they're separating. I think Euhemerus is right. The creation gods should go back to, the, to God himself. Okay, but what they're doing is they're worshiping creation. They're, they're calling Earth a mother. They're calling the atmosphere of the sky a father. And then they're going to the people, Adam, Eve, Noah, Nimrod, they got good guys, bad guys.
So we're going to talk next time about Egypt. They have a god named Osiris. They got a wife named Isis. They have a child named Horus. We'll talk about it. Look at the back of a dollar bill. See if you see something with Horus. See something? We'll take a break.